Act One of The Gamester by Edward Moore. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface It having been objected to this tragedy, that its language is prose, and its catastrophe too horrible, I shall entreat the reader's patience for a minute, that I may say a word or two to these objections. The play of the gamester was intended to be a natural picture of that kind of life of which all men are judges, and as it struck at a vice so universally prevailing, it was thought proper to adapt its language to the capacities and feelings of every part of the audience, that as some of its characters were of no higher rank than sharpers, it was imagined that, whatever good company they may find admittance to in the world, their speaking blank verse upon the stage would be unnatural, if not ridiculous. But though the more elevated characters also speak prose, the judicious reader will observe that it is a species of prose which differs very little from verse. In many of the most animated scenes I can truly say that I often found it a much greater difficulty to avoid than to write measure. I shall only add, in answer to this objection, that I hoped to be more interesting by being more natural, and the event, as far as I have been a witness of it, has more than answered my expectations. As to the other objection, the horror of its catastrophe, if it be considered simply what that catastrophe is, and compared with those other tragedies, I should humbly presume that the working it up to any uncommon degree of horror is the merit of the play, and not its reproach. Nor should so prevailing and destructive a vice as gaming be attacked upon the theatre, without impressing upon the imagination all the horrors that may attend it. I shall detain the reader no longer than to inform him that I am indebted for many of the most popular passages in this play to the inimitable performer, who, in the character of the gamester, exceeded every idea I had conceived of it in the writing. Prologue Written and spoken by Mr. Garrick Like famed La Mancha's knight, who lands in hand, mounted his steed to free the enchanted land. Our Coyote Bard sets forth a monster taming, armed at all points to fight that Hydra gaming. Aloft on Pegasus he waves his pen, and hurls defiance at the caitiff's den. The first on fancied giants spent his rage, but this has more than windmills to engage. He combats passion, rooted in the soul, whose powers at once delight ye and control whose magic bondage each lost slave enjoys, nor wishes freedom, though the spell destroys. To save our land from this magician's charms, and rescue maids and matrons from his arms, our knight poetic comes. And, O oh, ye fair, this black enchanter's wicked arts beware. His subtle poison dims the brightest eyes, and at his touch each grace and beauty dies. Love, gentleness, and joy to rage give way, and the soft dove becomes a bird of prey. May this our bold adventurer break the spell, and drive the demon to his native hell. Ye slaves of passion, and ye dupes of chance, wake all your powers from this destructive trance. Shake off the shackles of this tyrant vice, hear other calls than those of cards and dice. Be learned in nobler arts than arts of play, and other debts than those of honor pay. No longer live insensible to shame, lost to your country, families, and fame. Could our romantic muse this work achieve? Would there one honest heart in Britain grieve? The attempt, though wild, would not in vain be made, if every honest hand would lend its aid. Dramatis Personae Men Beverly Read by Todd Lucin. Read by T.J. Burns. 
Stukely, read by Thomas Peter. Jarvis, read by Alan Mapstone. Bates, read by Joseph Tabler. Dawson, read by Son of the Exiles. Waiter, read by Nemo. Women. Mrs. Bowley, read by Linda Olson Fytak. Charlotte, read by Eva Davis. Lucy, read by Sonia. Narrated by Rob Board. Scene, London. The Gamester, a tragedy. Act One, Scene One. Enter Mrs. Beverley and Charlotte. Be comforted, my dear. All may be well yet. And now, methinks, the lodgings begin to look with another face. Oh, sister, sister, if these were all my hardships, if all I had to complain of were no more than quitting my house, servants, equipage and show, your pity would be weakness. Is poverty nothing, then? Nothing in the world, if it affected only me. While we had a fortune, I was the happiest of the rich. And now it is gone. Give me but a bare subsistence, and my husband smiles, and I'll be the happiest of the poor. To me now these lodgings want nothing but their master. Why do you look so at me? <sighs> that I may hate my brother. Don't talk so, Charlotte. Has he not undone you? Oh, this pernicious vice of caming. But methinks his usual hours of four or five in the morning might have contented him. "'Twas misery enough to wake for him till then. "'Need he have stayed out all night? "'I shall learn to detest him.' "'Not for the first fault. "'He never slept from me before.' "'Slept from you? "'No, no, his nights have nothing to do with sleep. "'How has this one vice driven him from every virtue? "'Nay, from his affections too. "'The time was, sister.' "'And is. "'I have no fear of his affection.' Would I knew that he was safe. From ruin and his companions. But that's impossible. His poor little boy, too. What must become of him? Why, want shall teach him industry. From his father's mistakes he shall learn prudence, and from his mother's resignation, patience. Poverty has no such terrors in it as you imagine. There's no condition of life, sickness, and pain accepted where happiness is excluded. The needy peasant, who rises early to his labour, enjoys more welcome rest at night for it. His bread is sweeter to him, his home happier, his family dearer, his enjoyments surer. The sun that rouses him in the morning sets in the evening to release him. All situations have their comforts, if sweet contentment dwell in the heart. But my poor Beverly has none. The thought of having ruined those he loves is misery for ever to him. Would I could ease his mind of that. If he alone were ruined, twere just he should be punished. He is my brother, tis true, but when I think of what he has done, of the fortune he brought him, of his own large estate, too, squandered away upon this vilest of passions, and among the vilest of wretches. I have no patience. My own little fortune is untouched, he says. Would I were sure on it. And so you may. T'would be a sin to doubt it. I will be sure on it. T'was madness in me to give it to his management. But I'll demand it from him this morning. I have a melancholy occasion for it. What occasion? To support a sister. No, I have no need on it. Take it, and reward a lover with it. The generous Lucen deserves much more. Why won't you make him happy? Because my sister's miserable. You must not think so. I have my jewels left yet. I'll sell them to supply our wants, and when all's gone these hands shall toil for our support. The poor should be industrious. Why those tears, Charlotte? They flow in pity for you. All may be well yet, 
when he has nothing to lose i shall fetter him in these arms again and then what is it to be poor cure him but of this destructive passion and my uncle's death may retrieve all yet i charlotte could we cure him but the disease of play admits no cure but poverty and the loss of another fortune would but increase his shame and his affliction will mr lewson call this morning he said so last night he gave me hints too that he had suspicions of our friend stukely not of treachery to your brother that he loves play i know but surely he is honest he would fain be thought so therefore i doubt him honesty needs no pains to set itself off what now lucy scene two enter lucy your old steward madam i had not the heart to deny him admittance the good old man begged so hard for it exit scene three enter jarvis is this well jarvis i desired you to avoid me did you ma'am i am an old man and had forgot perhaps too you forbade my tears but i am old ma'am and age will be forgetful mrs beverley to charlotte the faithful creature how he moves me not to have seen him had been cruelty i forgot these apartments too i remember none such in my young master's house and yet i have lived in it these five-and-twenty years his good father would not have dismissed me he had no reason jarvis i was faithful to him while he lived and when he died he bequeathed me to his son i've been faithful to him too i know it i know it jarvis we both know it i am an old man ma'am and have not a long time to live i ask but to have died with him and he dismissed me prithee no more of this twas his poverty that dismissed you is he indeed so poor then oh he was the joy of my old heart but must his creditors have all and have they sold his house too his father built it when he was but a prating boy the times i've carried him in these arms and jarvis says he when a beggar has asked charity of me why should people be poor you shan't be poor jarvis if i was a king nobody should be poor yet he is poor and then he was so brave oh he was a brave little boy and yet so merciful he'd not have killed a gnat that stung him speak to him charlotte for i cannot when i have wiped my eyes i have a little money ma'am it might have been more but i have loved the poor all that i have is yours no jarvis we have enough yet i thank you though and will deserve your goodness but shall i see my master and will he let me attend him in his distresses i'll be no expense to him and twill kill me to be refused where is he ma'am not at home jarvis you shall see him another time to-morrow or the next day oh jarvis what a change is here a change indeed ma'am my old heart aches at it and yet methinks but here's somebody coming scene four enter lucy with stukely mr stukely madam exit good morning to you ladies mr jarvis your servant to mrs beverley where's my friend madam i should have asked that question of you have you not seen him to-day no madam nor last night last night did not he come home then no were not you together 
at the beginning of the evening, but not since. Where can he have stayed? You call yourself his friend, sir. Why do you encourage him in this madness of gaming? You have asked me that question before, madam. I told you my concern was that I could not save him. Mr. Beverley is a man, madam, and if the most friendly entreaties have no effect upon him, I have no other means. My purse has been his, even to the injury of my fortune. If that has been encouragement, I deserve censure, but I meant it to retrieve him. I don't doubt it, sir, and I thank you. But where did you leave him last night? At Wilson's, madam, if I ought to tell. In company I do not like. Possibly he may be there still. Mr. Jarvis knows the house, I believe. Shall I go, ma'am? No, he may take it ill. He may go as from himself. And if he pleases, madam, without naming me, I am faulty myself and should conceal the errors of a friend. But I can refuse nothing here. Bowing to the ladies. I would fain see him, methinks. Do so then, but take care how you upbraid him. I have never upbraided him. Would I could bring him comfort. Exit. Don't be too much alarmed, madam. All men have their errors, and the times of seeing them. Perhaps my friend's time has not come yet. But he has an uncle. Dull men don't live forever. You should look forward, madam. They are taught how to value a second fortune by the loss of a first. A knocking at the door. <gasps> Hark! No, that knocking was much too rude for Mr. Beverley. Pray heaven he be well. Never doubt it, madam. You shall be well too. Everything shall be well. Knocking again. The knocking is a little loud, though. Who waits there? Will none of you answer? None of you, did I say? Alas, I thought myself in my own house, surrounded with servants. I'll go, sister, but don't be alarmed so. Exit. What extraordinary accident have you to fear, madam? I beg your pardon, but is ever thus with me in Mr. Beverley's absence. No one knocks at the door, but I fancy it is a messenger of ill news. You are too fearful, madam. It was but one night of absence. And if ill thoughts intrude, as love is always doubtful, think of your worth and beauty, and drive them from your breast. What thoughts? I have no thoughts that wrong my husband. Such thoughts indeed would wrong him. The world is full of slander, and every wretch that knows himself unjust charges his neighbour with like passions, and by the general frailty hides his own. If you are wise and would be happy, turn a deaf ear to such reports. It is ruin to believe them. Ay, worse than ruin. T'would be to sin against conviction. Why was it mentioned? To guard you against rumour. The sport of half mankind is mischief, and for a single error they make men devils. If their tales reach you, disbelieve them. What tales? By whom? Why told? I have heard nothing. Or if I had, with all his errors, my Beverley's firm faith admits no doubt. It is my safety, my seat of rest and joy, while the storm threatens around me. I'll not forsake it. Stukely sighs and looks down. Why turn you from me, and why that sigh? I was attentive, madam, and sighs would come we know not why. Perhaps I have been too busy. If it should seem so, impute my zeal to friendship that meant to guard you against evil tongues. Your Beverly is wronged, slandered most vilely, my life upon his truth. And mine too. Who is it that doubts it? But no matter. I am prepared, sir. Yet why this caution? You are my husband's friend. I think you mine too the common friend of both. I had been unconcerned else. For heaven's sake, madam, be so still. I meant to guard you against suspicion, not to alarm it. Nor have you, sir. Who told you of suspicion? I have a heart it cannot reach. Then I am happy. I would say more, but am prevented. 
Scene five. Re enter Charlotte. Who was it, Charlotte? What a heart has that Jarvis, a creditor, sister. But the good old man has taken him away. Don't distress his wife, don't distress his sister, I could hear him say. Tis cruel to distress the afflicted. And when he saw me at the door, he begged pardon that his friend had knocked so loud. I wish I had known of this. Was it a large demand, madam? I heard not that, but visits such as these we must expect often. Why so distressed, sister? This is no new affliction. No, Charlotte, but I am faint with watching, quite sunk and spiritless. Will you excuse me, sir? I'll to my chamber and try to rest a little. Good thoughts go with you, madam. Exit Mrs. Beverley. Stukely aside. My bait is taken, then. Poor Mrs. Beverley, how my heart grieves to see her thus. Cure her, and be a friend, then. How cure her, madam? Reclaim my brother. Ay, give him a new creation, or breathe another soul into him. Ah, think on, madam. Advice, I see, is thankless. Useless, I am sure it is, if through mistaken friendship or other motives you feed his passion with your purse and soothe it by example. Physicians to cure fevers keep from the patient's thirsty lip the cup that would inflame him. You give it to his hands. A knocking. Hark, sir, these are my brother's desperate symptoms. Another creditor. One not so easily got rid of. What? Lucen. Scene six. Enter Lucen. Madam, your servant. Yours, sir. I was inquiring for you at your lodgings. This morning? You had business, then? You'll call it by another name, perhaps. Where is Mr. Beverly, madam? We have sent to inquire for him. Is he abroad, then? He did not used to go out so early. No, nor to stay out so late. Is that the case? I am sorry for it. But Mr. Stukeley, perhaps, may direct you to him. I have already, sir. But what was your business with me? To congratulate you upon your late successes at play. Poor Beverly. But you are his friend. And there is comfort in having successful friends. And what am I to understand by this? That Beverly's a poor man with a rich friend that's all your words would mean something i suppose another time sir i should desire an explanation and why not now i am no dealer in long sentences a minute or two will do for me but not for me sir i am slow of apprehension and must have time and privacy the lady's presence engages my attention Another morning I may be found at home. Another morning, then. I'll wait upon you. I shall expect you, sir. Madam, your servant. Exit. What mean you by this? To hint to him that I know him. How know him? Mere doubt and supposition. I shall have proof soon. And what then? Would you risk your life to be his punisher? My life, madam, don't be afraid. And yet, I am happy in your concern for me. But let it content you that I know this Stukely. T'would be as easy to make him honest as brave. And what do you intend to do? Nothing, till I have proof. Yet my suspicions are well grounded. But methinks, madam, I am acting here without authority. Could I have leave to call Mr. Beverly brother, his concerns would be my own. Why will you make my services appear officious? You know my reasons, and should not press me. But I am cold, you say, and cold I will be, while a poor sister's destitute. My heart bleeds for her. 
until i see her sorrows moderated love has no joys for me can i be less a friend by being a brother i would not say an unkind thing but the pillar of your house is shaken prop it with another and it shall stand firm again you must comply and will when i have peace within myself but let us change the subject your business here this morning is with my sister misfortunes press too hard upon her yet till to-day she has borne them nobly where is she gone to her chamber her spirits failed her i hear her coming let what has passed with stukely be a secret she has already too much to trouble her scene seven enter mrs beverley good morning sir i heard your voice and as i thought inquiring for me where's mr stukely charlotte this moment gone you have been in tears sister but here's a friend shall comfort you or if i add to your distresses i'll beg your pardon madam the sale of your house and furniture was finished yesterday i know it sir i know too your generous reason for putting me in mind of it but you have obliged me too much already there are trifles madam which you have set a value on those i have purchased and will deliver i have a friend too that esteems you he has bought largely and will call nothing his till he has seen you if a visit to him would not be painful he has begged it may be this morning not painful in the least my pain is from the kindness of my friends why am i obliged beyond the power of return you shall repay us at your own time i have a coach waiting at the door to charlotte shall we have your company madam no my brother may return soon i'll stay and receive him he may want a comforter perhaps but don't upbraid him charlotte we shan't be absent long come sir since i must be so obliged tis i that am obliged an hour or less will be sufficient for us to charlotte we shall find you at home madam exit with mrs beverley certainly i have but little inclination to appear abroad ah oh, this brother this brother to what wretchedness he has reduced us exit scene eight changes to stukeley's lodgings enter stukeley that lucian suspects me tis too plain yet why should he suspect me i appear the friend of beverley as well as he but i am rich it seems and so i am thanks to another's folly and my own wisdom to what use is wisdom but to take advantage of the weak this beverley's my fool i cheat him and he calls me friend but more business must be done yet his wife's jewels are unsold so is the reversion of his uncle's estate oh, i must have these two and then there's a treasure above all i love his wife before she knew this beverley i loved her but like a cringing fool bowed at a distance while he stepped in and won her never never will i forgive him for it my pride as well as love is wounded by this conquest i must have vengeance those hints this morning were well thrown in already they have fastened on her if jealousy should weaken her affections one to make corrupt her virtue my hate rejoices in the hope these jewels may do much you shall demand them of her which when mine shall be converted to special purposes what now bates scene nine enter bates is it a wonder then to see me the forces are in readiness and only wait for orders where's beverley a last night's rendezvous waiting for me is dawson with you dressed like a nobleman with money in his pocket and a set of dice that shall deceive the devil that fellow has a head to undo a nation but for the rest they are such low-mannered ill-looking dogs oh, i wonder beverley has not suspected them no matter for manners and looks 
do you supply them with money and they are gentlemen by profession the passion of gaming casts such a mist before the eyes that the nobleman shall be surrounded with sharpers and imagine himself in the best company there's that williams too it was he i suppose that called at beverley's with the note this morning what directions did you give him to knock loud and be clamorous did not you see him nah the fool sneaked off with jarvis had he appeared within doors as directed the note had been discharged i waited there on purpose i want the women to think well of me a loosen's grown suspicious they tell me so himself what answer did you make him a short one that i would see him soon for farther explanation we must take care of him but what have we to do with beverley dawson and the rest are wondering at you why let them wonder i have designs above their narrow reach they see me lend him money and they stare at me ha they are fools i want him to believe me beggared by him and what then ah there's the question but no matter at night you may know more he waits for me at wilson's i tell the women where to find him to what purpose to save suspicion it looked friendly and they thanked me old jarvis was dispatched to him and may entreat him home now nah. he expects money from me but i'll have none his wife's jewels must go women are easy creatures and refuse nothing where they love follow me to wilson's but be sure he sees you not you are a man of character you know of prudence and discretion wait for me in an outer room i shall have business for you presently come sir let judging fools by honesty grow great the shorter road to riches is deceit excellent end of act one Act Two of The Gamester by Edward Moore. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two Scene A gaming house with a table, box, dice, etc. Beverly is discovered sitting. Why, what a world is this! The slave that digs for gold receives his daily pittance and sleeps contented, while those for whom he labors convert their good to mischief, making abundance the means of want. Oh, shame! Shame! Had fortune given me but a little, that little had been still my own. But plenty leads to waste, and shallow streams maintain their currents, while swelling rivers beat down their banks and leave their channels empty. What had I to do with play? I wanted nothing. My wishes and my means were equal. The poor followed me with blessings. Love scattered roses on my pillow, and morning waked me to delight. Oh, bitter thought! That leads to what I was, by what I am. I could forget both. Who's there? Scene two. Enter a waiter. A gentleman, sir, inquires for you. He might have used less ceremony. Stukely, I suppose? No, sir. A stranger. Well, show him in. Exit waiter. A messenger from Stukely, then. From him that has undone me. Yet, all in friendship, and now he lends me from his little to bring back fortune to me. Scene three. Enter Jarvis. Jarvis? Why this intrusion? Your absence had been kinder. I came in duty, sir. If it be troublesome... It is. I would be private, hid even from myself. Who sent you hither? One that would persuade you home again. My mistress is not well. Her tears told me so. Go with thy duty there, then. But does she weep? I am to blame to let her weep. Prithee be gone. I have no business for thee. Yes, sir. 
to lead you from this place i am your servant still your prosperous fortune blessed my old age if that has left you i must not leave you not leave me recall past time then or through this sea of storms and darkness show me a star to guide me but what canst thou the little that i can i will you have been generous to me i would not offend you sir but no thinkest thou i'd ruin thee too i have enough of shame already my wife my wife wouldst thou believe it jarvis i have not seen her all this long night i who have loved her so that every hour of absence seemed as a gap in life but other bonds have held me oh i have played the boy dropping my counters in the stream and reaching to redeem them have lost myself why wilt thou follow misery or if thou wilt go to thy mistress she has no guilt to sting her and therefore may be comforted for pity's sake sir i have no heart to see this change nor i to bear it how speaks the world of me jarvis as of a good man dead of one who walking in a dream fell down a precipice the world is sorry for you ah and pities me says it not so but i was born to infamy i'll tell thee what it says it calls me villain a treacherous husband a cruel father a false brother one lost to nature and her charities or to say all in one short word it calls me gamester go to thy mistress i'll see her presently and why not now rude people press upon her loud bawling creditors wretches who know no pity i met one at the door he would have seen my mistress i wanted means of present payment so promised it to-morrow but others may be pressing and she has grief enough already your absence hangs too heavy on her tell her i'll come then i have a moment's business but what hast thou to do with my distresses thy honesty has left thee poor and age wants comfort keep what thou hast for cordials lest between thee and the grave misery steal in i have a friend shall counsel me this is that friend scene four enter stukely how fares it beverly honest mr jarvis well met i hope to find you here that viper williams was it not he that troubled you this morning my mistress heard him then i am sorry that she heard him and jarvis promised payment that must not be tell him i'll satisfy him will you sir heaven will reward you for it generous dukely friendship like yours had an ability like will would more than balance the wrongs of fortune you think too kindly of me to jarvis make haste to williams his clamours may be rude else and my master will go home again alas sir we know of hearts there breaking for his absence exit would i were dead or turned hermit counting a string of beads in a dark cave or under a weeping willow praying for mercy on the wicked <laughs> for thee be a man and leave dying to disease and old age fortune may be ours again at least we'll try for it no it has fooled us on too far ay ruined us and therefore we'll sit down contented these are the despondings of men without money but let the shining ore chink in the pocket and folly turn us to wisdom we are fortune's children true she's a fickle mother but shall we droop because she's peevish ah she smiles in store and these are frowns are meant to brighten them is this a time for levity 
but you are single in the ruin and therefore may talk lightly of it with me tis complicated misery you censure me unjustly i but assume these spirits to cheer my friend heaven knows he wants a comforter what new misfortune i would have brought you money but lenders want securities what's to be done all that was mine is yours already and there's the weight that sinks me i have undone my friend too one who to save a drowning wretch reached out his hand and perished with him have better thoughts whence are they to proceed i have nothing left <sighs> then we're indeed undone what nothing no movables no useless trinkets baubles locked up in caskets to starve their owners i have ventured deeply for you therefore this heartache for i am lost beyond all hope no means may be found to save us jarvis is rich who made him so this is no time for ceremony and is it for dishonesty the good old man shall i rob him too my friend would grieve for it no let the little that he has buy food and clothing for him good morning then going so hasty why then good morning and when we meet again a brain me see it was i that tempted you tell loose and so and tell him i have wronged you your suspicions of me and will thank you no we have been companions in a rash voyage and the same storm has wrecked us both mine shall be self upbraidings and will they feed us you deal unkindly by me i have sold and borrowed for you while land or credit lasted and now when fortune should be tried and my heart whispers me success i am deserted turned loose to beggary while well, you have hordes what hordes name them and take them jewels and shall this thriftless hand seize them too my poor poor wife must she lose all i would not wound her so nor i but from necessity one effort more and fortune may grow kind i have unusual hopes think of some other means then i have ye rejected them prithee let me be a man ay your friend a poor one but i have done for these trinkets of a woman why let her keep them to deck out pride with and show a laughing world that she is far right to starve in no she shall yield up all my friend demands it but need he have talked lightly of her the jewels that she values are truth and innocence those will adorn her ever and for the rest she wore them for a husband's pride and to his wants will give them alas you know her not when shall we meet no matter i have changed my mind leave me to a prison tis the reward of friendship perish mankind first leave you to a prison no fallen as you see me i'm not that wretch nor would i change this heart overcharged as tis with folly and misfortune for one most prudent and most happy if callous to a friend's distresses you are too warm in such a case not to be warm is to be frozen farewell i'll meet you at your lodgings reflect a little the jews may be lost better not hazard them oh, i was too pressing and i ungrateful reflection takes up time i have no leisure for it within an hour expect me exit the thoughtless shadow prodigal we shall have sport at night then but hold the jewels are not ours yet the lady may refuse them the husband may relent too it is more than probable i'll write a note to beverley that the contents shall spur him to demand them but in my grand this rogue through avarice now i have warmer motives love and revenge ruin the husband and the wife's virtue may be bid for 
"'Tis of uncertain value, and sinks or rises in the purchase, "'as want or wealth or passion governs. "'The poor part cheaply with it. "'Rich dames, though pleased with selling, will have high prices for it. "'Your love-set girls give it for oaths or lying. "'But wives, who boast of honour and affections, keep it against a famine. "'Why, let the famine come, then. "'I am in haste to purchase.' Scene five. Enter Bates. Look to your men, Bates. There's money, Sturham. <laughs> we meet to night upon this spot. Hasten and tell them so. Beverley calls upon me at my lodgings, and we return together. Hasten, I say. The rogues will scatter else. Not till their leader bids them. Oh, come on, then. Give them the word and follow me. I must advise with you. This is a day of business. Exeunt. Scene six. Changes to Beverly's lodgings. Enter Beverly and Charlotte. Your looks are changed too. There's wildness in him. My wretched sister, how it will grieve her to see you thus. No, no. A little rest will ease me. And for your loosens kindness to her, it has my thanks. I have no more to give him. Yes, sister and her fortune. I trifle with him, and he complains. My looks, he says, are called upon him. He thinks, too, that I have lost your fortune. He dares not think so. Nor does he. You are too quick at guessing. He cares not if you had. That care is mine. I lent it you to husband, and now I claim it. You have suspicions, then? Cure them, and give it me. To stop a sister's chiding? To vindicate her brother. How if he needs it not? I would fain hope so. I would, and cannot. Leave it to time, then. T'will satisfy all doubts. Mine are already satisfied. Tis well. And when the subject is renewed, speak to me like a sister, and I will answer like a brother. To tell me I'm a beggar. Why, tell it now. I that can bear the ruin of those dearer to me, the ruin of a sister and her infant, can bear that too. No more of this. You wring my heart. Would that the misery were all your own, but innocence must suffer. Unthinking rioter, whose home was heaven to him, an angel dwelt there, and a little cherub that crowned his days with blessings. How has he lost this heaven to league with devils? Forbear, I say. Reproaches come too late. They search, but cure not. And for the fortune you demand, we'll talk to-morrow, aunt. Our tempers may be milder. Or, oh, if tis gone, why, farewell all. I claimed it for a sister. She holds my heart in hers, and every pang she feels tears it in pieces. But I'll upbraid no more. What heaven permits, it may ordain and sorrow then is sinful. Yet that the husband, father, brother, should be its instrument of vengeance, tis grievous to know that. If you're my sister, spare the remembrance. It wounds too deeply. Tomorrow shall clear all, and when the worst is known, it may be better than your fears. Comfort my wife, and for the pains of absence, I'll make atonement. The world may yet go well with us. See where she comes. Look cheerfully upon her. Affections such as hers are prying, and lend those eyes that read the soul. Scene 7. Enter Mrs. Beverley and Lucen. My life! My love! How fares it? I have been a truant husband. But we meet now, and that heals all. Doubts and alarms I have had, but in this dear embrace I bury and forget them. My friend here, pointing to Lucen, has been indeed a friend. Charlotte, tis you must thank him. Your brother's thanks and mine are of too little value. Yet what we have, I'll pay. I thank you, sir, and am obliged. I would say more, but that your goodness to the wife upbraids the husband's follies. Had I been wise, she had not trespassed on your bounty. Nor has she trespassed. 
The little I have done, acceptance overpays. So friendship thinks. And doubles obligations by striving to conceal them. We'll talk another time on it. You are too thoughtful, love. No, I have reason for these thoughts. And hatred for the cause. Would you have that too? I have. The cause was avarice. And who the tempter? A ruined friend. Ruined by too much kindness. Ay, worse than ruined. Stabbed in his fame. Mortally stabbed. Riches can't cure him. Or if they could, those I have drained him of. Something of this he hinted in the morning, that Lucin had suspicions of him. Why these suspicions? At school we knew this Stukely. A cunning, plotting boy he was. Sordid and cruel. Slow at his talk, but quick at shifts and tricking. He schemed out mischief that others might be punished, and would tell his tale with so much art that for the lash he merited, rewards and praise were given him. Show me a boy with such a mind, and time that ripens manhood in him shall ripen vice too. I'll prove him, and lay him open to you. Till then, be warned. I know him, and therefore shun him. And I would those that wrong him. You are too busy, sir. No, not too busy. Mistaken, perhaps. That had been milder. No matter, madam. I can bear this, and praise the heart that prompts it. Pity such friendship should be so placed. Again, sir. But I'll bear too. You wrong him, Lucin, and will be sorry for it. I, when tis proved he wrongs him, the world is full of hypocrites. And Stukely won, so you infer, I think. I'll hear no more of this. My heart aches for him. I have undone him. The world says otherwise. The world is false, then. To Mrs. Beverley. I have business with you, love. We'll leave them to their rancor going no we shall find room within for it to loosen come this way sir another time my friend will thank me that time is hastening too exit with charlotte they hurt me beyond bearing is dukely false then honesty has left us twere sinning against heaven to think so i never doubted him no you are charity Meekness and ever-during patience live in that heart, and love that knows no change. Why did I ruin you? You have not ruined me. I have no wants when you are present, nor wishes in your absence, but to be blessed with your return. Be but resigned to what has happened, and I am rich beyond the dreams of avarice. My generous girl! But memory will be busy still crowding on my thoughts to sour the present by the past. I have another pang, too. Tell it, and let me cure it. That friend, that generous friend, whose fame they have traduced? I have undone him, too. While he had means, he lent me largely, and now a prison must be his portion. No, I hope otherwise. To hope must be to act. The charitable wish feeds not the hungry. Something must be done. What? In bitterness of heart he told me. Just now he told me I had undone him. Could I hear that and think of happiness? No, I have disclaimed it while he is miserable. The world may mend with us, and then we may be grateful. There's comfort in that hope. Aye. Is the sick man's cordial his promised cure? While in preparing it, the patient dies. What now? Scene 8. Enter Lucy. A letter, sir. Delivers it and exit. The hand is Dukeley's. Opens and reads it to himself. And brings good news. At least I'll hope so. What says he, love? why this too much for patience 
yet he directs me to conceal it from you hmm reads let your haste to see me be the only proof of your esteem for me i have determined since we parted to bid adieu to england choosing rather to forsake my country than to owe my freedom in it to the means we talked of keep this a secret at home and hasten to the ruined r stukeley ruined by friendship i must relieve or follow him follow him did you say then i am lost indeed oh this infernal vice how has it sunk me a vice whose highest joy was poor to my domestic happiness yet how have i pursued it turned all my comforts to bitterest pangs and all thy smiles to tears damned damned infatuation be cool my life what are the means the letter talks of have you have i those means tell me and ease me i have no life while you are wretched no no it must not be tis i alone have sinned tis i alone must suffer you shall reserve those means to keep my child and his wronged mother from want and wretchedness what means i came to rob you of them but cannot dare not those jewels are your sole support i should be more than monster to request them my jewels trifles not worth the speaking of if weighed against a husband's peace but let them purchase that and the world's wealth is of less value amazing goodness how little do i see him before such virtues no more my love i kept them till occasion called to use them now is the occasion and i'll resign them cheerfully why we'll be rich in love then but this excess of kindness melts me yet for a friend one would do much he has denied me nothing come to my closet but let him manage wisely we have no more to give him where learnt my love this excellence tis heaven's own teaching that heaven which to an angel's form has given a mind more lovely i am unworthy of you but will deserve you better henceforth my follies and neglects shall cease and all to come be penitence and peace vice shall no more attract me with her charms nor pleasure reach me but in these dear arms excellent end of act two act three of the gamester by edward moore this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Act 3. Scene 1. Stukeley's Lodgings. Enter Stukeley and Bates. So runs the world, Bates. Whose are the natural prey of knaves? Nature designed them so, when she made lambs for wolves. The laws that fear and policy are framed, nature disclaims. She knows but two those are force and cunning the nobler law is force but then there's danger in it or well, cunning like a skilful miner works safely and unseen and therefore wisely force must have nerves and sinews cunning wants neither the dwarf that has it shall trip the giant's heels up and bind him to the ground why we'll erect a shrine for nature and be her oracles conscience is weakness fear made and fear maintains it the dread of shame inward reproaches and fictitious burnings swell out the phantom nature knows none of this her laws are freedom sound doctrine and well delivered we are sincere too and practice what we teach let the grave pedant say as much but now the business the jewels are disposed of and beverley again worth money he waits to count his gold out and then comes hither if my design succeeds this night we finish with him go to your lodgings and be busy 
you understand conveyances and can make ruins sure better stop here the sale of this reversion may be talked of there's danger in it no tis the mark i aim at we'll thrive and laugh you are the purchaser and there's the payment giving a pocket book he thinks you're rich and so you shall be inquire for titles and deal hardly to look like honesty how if he suspects us leave it to me i study hearts and went to work upon em go to your lodgings and if we come be busy over papers talk of a thoughtless age of gaming and extravagance you have a face for it a feeling too that would avoid it we push too far but i have cautioned you if it ends ill you'll think of me and so adieu exit this fellow sins by halves his fears are conscience to him i will turn these fears to use rogues that dread shame will still be greater rogues to hide their guilt this shall be thought of loosen grows troublesome we must get rid of him he knows too much i have a tale for beverly part of a truth too he shall call loose into account if it succeeds tis well if not we must try other means but here he comes i must assemble scene two enter beverley look to the door there in a seeming fright oh, my friend oh, i thought of other visitors no these shall guard you from them offering notes take them and use them cautiously the world deals hardly by us and shall i leave you destitute no your wants are greatest another climate may treat me kinder the shelter of to-night takes me from this let these be your support then yet is there need of parting i may have means again we'll share them and live wisely no i should tempt you on habitous nature in me ruin can't cure it even now i would be gaming top by experience as i am and knowing this poor sum is all that's left us i'm for venturing still and say i am to blame yet will this little supply our wants now we must put it out to usury whether tis madness in me or some resistless impulse of good fortune i yet am ignorant but take it and succeed then i'll try no more tis surely impulse it pleads so strongly that you are cold we'll even part here then and for this last reserve keep it for better uses i'll have none on t ah thank you though it will seek fortune singly one thing i had forgot what is it perhaps to a best forgotten but i am open in my nature and zealous for the honour of my friend lucian speaks freely of you of you i know he does i can forgive him for it but for my friend i am angry what says he of me that charlotte's fortune is embezzled he talks on loudly he shall be silenced then how heard you of it for many he questioned bates about it you must account with him he says or he with me and soon too speak mildly to him the cautions are best i'll think aunt but whither go you from poverty and prisons no matter whither if fortune changes you may hear from me may these be prosperous then offering the notes which he refuses nay they are yours i have sworn it and will have nothing take them and use them singly i will not my cares are for my friend for his lost fortune and ruined family all separate interests i disclaim together we have fallen together we must rise my heart my honour both will have it so i am weary of being fooled and so am i here let us part then these buildings of good fortune shall be stifled i'll call them folly and forget them this one embrace and then farewell offering to embrace no stay a moment 
how my poor heart's distracted. I have these bodings, too, but whether caught from you, or prompted by my good or evil genius, I know not. The trial shall determine. And yet, my wife? Ay, ay, she'll chide. No. Pointing to his heart. My chidings are all here. I'll not persuade you. I am persuaded. By reason, too, the strongest reason, necessity. Oh, could I once regain the height I have fallen from, heaven should forsake me in my latest hour if I again mixed in these scenes, or sacrificed the husband's peace, his joy, and best affections to avarice and infamy. I have resolved like you, and since our motives are so honest, why should we fear success? Come on, then. Where shall we meet? At Wilson's. Yet if it hurts you, leave me. I have misled you often. We have misled each other. But come, fortune is fickle, and may be tired with plaguing us. There let us rest our hopes. Yet think a little. I cannot. Thinking but distracts me. When desperation leads, all thoughts are vain. Reason would lose what rashness may obtain. Exeunt. Scene 3. Beverley's Lodgings. Enter Mrs. Beverley and Charlotte. Twas all a scheme, a mean one, unworthy of my brother. No, I'm sure it was not. Stukely is honest too, I know he is. This madness has undone them both. My brother, irrecoverably, you are too spiritless a wife. A mournful tale, mixed with a few kind words, will steal away your soul. The world's too subtle for such goodness. Had I been by, he should have asked your life sooner than those jewels. He should have had it, then. I live but to oblige him. She who can love, and is beloved, like me, will do as much. Men have done more for mistresses, and women for a base deluder and shall a wife do less your chidings hurt me charlotte and come too late they might have saved you else how could he use you so twas friendship did it his heart was breaking for a friend the friend that has betrayed him prithee don't think so to-morrow he accounts with me and fairly i will not doubt it unless a friend has wanted I have no patience, sister. Sister, we are bound to curse this friend. My Beverly speaks nobly of him. And loose and truly. But I displease you with this talk. Tomorrow will instruct us. Stay till it comes, then. I would not think so hardly. Nor I, but from conviction. Yet we have hope of better days. My uncle is infirm and of an age that threatens hourly. Or if he lives, you never have offended him, and for distresses so unmerited, he will have pity. I know it, and am cheerful. We have no more to lose, and for what's gone. If it brings prudence home, the purchase is well made. My Lucin will be kind, too. While he and I have life and means, you shall divide with us. And see, he's here. Scene four. Enter Lucin. We were just speaking of you. Tis best to interrupt you, then. Few characters will bear a scrutiny, and where the bad outweighs the good, he's safest that's least talked of. To Charlotte. What say you, madam? That I hate scandal, though a woman, therefore talks seldom of you. Ah, oh, with more truth, that, though a woman, she loves to praise therefore talks always of you i'll leave you to decide it exit how good and amiable i came to talk in private with you of matters that concern you what matters first answer me sincerely to what i ask i will but you alarm me i am too grave perhaps but be assured of this, I have no news that troubles me, and therefore should not you. I am easy, then. Propose your question. Tis now a tedious twelve-month since 
with an open and kind heart you said you loved me so tedious did you say and when in consequence of such sweet words i press for marriage you gave a voluntary promise that you would live for me charlotte angrily you think me changed then i did not say so a thousand times i have pressed for the performance of this promise but private cares a brother's and a sister's ruin were reasons for delaying it i had no other reasons where will this end it shall end presently go on sir a promise such as this given freely not extorted the world thinks binding but i think otherwise and would release me from it you are too impatient madam cool sir quite cool pray go on time and a near acquaintance with my faults may have brought change if it be so or for a moment if you have wished this promise were unmade here i acquit you of it this is my question then and with such plainness as i ask it i shall entreat an answer have you repented of this promise stay sir the man that can suspect me shall find me changed why am i doubted my doubts are of myself i have my faults and you have observation if from my temper my words or actions you have conceived a thought against me or even a wish for separation all that has passed is nothing you startle me but tell me i must be answered first is it from honour that you speak this or do you wish me changed heaven knows i do not life and my charlotte are so connected that to lose one were loss of both yet for a promise though given in love and meant for binding if time or accident or reason should change opinion with me that promise has no force why now i'll answer you your doubts are prophecies i am really changed indeed i could torment you now as you have me but tis not my nature that i am changed i own for what at first was inclination is now grown reason in me and from that reason had i the world nay were i poorer than the poorest and you too wanting bread but with a hovel to invite me to i would be yours and happy my kindest charlotte seizing her hand thanks are too poor for this and words too weak but if we love so why should our union be delayed for happier times the present are too wretched i may have reasons that press it now what reasons the strongest reasons unanswerable ones be quick and name them no madam i am bound in honour to make conditions first i am bound by inclination too this sweet profusion of kind words pains while it pleases i dread the losing you astonishment what mean you first promise that to-morrow or the next day you will be mine for ever i do though misery should succeed loosen embracing her thus then i seize you and with you every joy on this side heaven and thus i seal my promise returning his embrace now sir your secret your fortune's lost my fortune lost i'll study to be humble then but was my promise claimed for this how nobly generous where learnt you this sad news from bates stukeley's prime agent i have obliged him and he's grateful he told me in friendship to warn me from my charlotte twas honest in him and i'll esteem him for it he knows much more than he has told 
for me it is enough and for your generous love i thank you from my soul if you'd oblige me more give me a little time why time it robs us of our happiness i have a task to learn first the little pride this fortune gave me must be subdued once we were equal and might have met obliging and obliged but now tis otherwise and for a life of obligations i have not learnt to bear it mine is that life you are too noble leave me to think on it to-morrow then you'll fix my happiness all that i can i will it must be so we live but for each other keep what you know a secret and when we meet to-morrow more may be known farewell exit my poor poor sister how would this wound her but i'll conceal it and speak comfort to her exit scene five changes to a room in the gaming house enter beverley and stukeley whither would you lead me where we may vent our curses i on yourself and those damned counsels that have destroyed me a thousand fiends were in that bosom and all let loose to tempt me i had resisted else go on sir i have deserved this from you and curses everlasting time is too scanty for them what have i done what the archdevil of old did soothed with false hopes for certain ruin myself and hurt nay pleased at your destruction or so your words mean why tell it to the world i am too poor to find a friend in t a friend what's he i had a friend and have one still ay i'll tell you of this friend he found me happiest of the happy fortune and honour crowned me and love and peace lived in my heart one spark of folly lurked there that too he found and by deceitful breath blew it to flames that have consumed me this friend were you to me a little more perhaps the friend who gave his all to save you and not succeeding chose ruin with you but no matter i have undone you and am a villain no i think not the villains are within what villains dawson and the rest we have been dupes to sharpers how know you this i have a doubt as well as you yet still as fortune changed i blushed at my own thoughts but you have proofs perhaps ay damned ones repeated losses night after night and no reverse chance has no hand in this i think more charitably yet i am peevish in my nature and apt to doubt the world speaks fairly of this dawson so does it of the rest we have watched them closely too but tis a right use of my losers to think the winners knaves we'll have more manhood in us i know not what to think this night has stung me to the quick blasted my reputation too i have bound my honour to these vipers played meanly upon credit till i tired them and now they shun me to rifle one another what's to be done nothing my counsels have been fatal by heaven i'll not survive this shame traitor tis you have brought it on me taking hold of him show me the means to save me or i'll commit a murder here and next upon myself why do it then and rid me of ingratitude prithee forgive this language i speak i know not what rage and despair are in my heart and hurry me to madness my home is horror to me i'll not return to it speak quickly tell me if in this wreck of fortune one hope remains name it and be my oracle to vent your curses on you have bestowed them liberally take your own counsel and should a desperate hope present itself to suit your desperate fortune i'll not advise you what hope by heaven i'll catch at it however desperate i am so sunk in misery it cannot lay me lower you have an uncle i what of him oh men live long by temperance or their heirs starve on expectation what mean you 
that the reversion's yours, and it will bring money to pay debts with, nay, more, that it may retrieve what's past. Or leave my child a beggar. And what's his father? A dishonourable one, engaged for sums he cannot pay. That should be thought of. It is my shame, the poison that inflames me. Where shall we go? To whom? I am impatient till all's lost. Or oh, maybe yours again. Your man is Bates. He has large funds at his command, and will deal justly by you. I am resolved. Tell them within we'll meet them presently, and with full purses too. Come, follow me. Nah, I'll have no hand in this, nor do I counsel it. Use your discretion, and act from that. You'll find me at my lodgings. Succeed what will, this night I'll dare the worst. Tis loss of fear to be completely cursed. Exit. Why, well, I lose it then forever. Fear is the mind's worst evil, and is a friendly office to drive it from the bosom. Thus far has fortune crowned me. Yet Beverly is rich, rich in his wife's best treasure, her honour and affections. I would supplant him there too, but tis the curse of thinking minds to raise up difficulties. Fools only conquer women. Fearless of dangers which they see not, they press on boldly, and by persisting prosper. Is may a tale of art do much. Charlotte is sometimes absent. The seeds of jealousy are sown already. If I mistake not, they have taken root too. Now is the time to ripen them, and reap the harvest. The softest of a sex, if wronged in love, or thinking that she is wronged, becomes a tigress in revenge. I'll instantly to Beverly's, no matter for the danger. When beauty leads us on, tis indiscretion to reflect, and cowardice to doubt. Exit. Scene 6. Changes to Beverly's lodgings. Enter Mrs. Beverly and Lucy. Did Charlotte tell you anything? No, madam. She looked confused, methought. Said she had business with her Lawson, which... When I pressed to know, tears only were her answer. She seemed in haste, too, yet her return may bring you comfort. No, my kind girl, I was not born for it. But why do I distress thee? Thy sympathizing heart bleeds for the ills of others. What pity that thy mistress can't reward thee. But there's a power above that sees and will remember all. Prithee, soothe me with the song thou sungst last night. It suits this change of fortune, and there's a melancholy in it that pleases me. I fear it hurts you, madam. Your goodness, too, draws tears from me, but I'll dry them and obey you. Song When Damon languished at my feet and i believed him true the moments of delight how sweet but ah how swift they flew the sunny hill the flowery vale the garden and the grove have echo to his ardent tale and vows of endless love the conquest gained he left his prize he left her to complain to talk of joy with weeping eyes and measure time by pain but heaven will take the mourner's part in pity to despair and the last sigh that rends the heart shall waft the spirit there i thank thee lucy i thank heaven too my griefs are none of these 
yet stupidly deals in hints he talks of rumours i'll urge him to speak plainly hark there's someone entering perhaps my master madam exit let him be well too and i am satisfied no tis another's voice his had been music to me who is it lucy scene seven re-enter lucy with stukely mr stukely madam exit to meet you thus alone madam was what i wished unseasonable visits when friendship warrants them need no excuse therefore i make none what mean you sir and where's your friend men may have secrets madam which their best friends are not admitted to we parted in the morning not soon to meet again you mean to leave us then to leave your country too i am no stranger to your reasons and pity your misfortunes your pity has undone you could beverley do this that letter was a false one a mean contrivance to rob you of your jewels i wrote it not impossible whence came it then wronged as i am madam i must speak plainly do so and ease me your hints have troubled me reports you say are stirring reports of whom you wished me not to credit them what sir are these reports i thought them slander madam and cautioned you in friendship left from officious tongues a tale had reached you with double aggravation proceed sir it is a debt due to my fame due to an injured wife too we both are injured how injured and who has injured us my friend your husband you would resent for both then but no sir my injuries are my own and do not need a champion be not too hasty madam i come not in resentment but for acquittance you thought me poor and to the feigned distresses of a friend gave up your jewels i gave them to a husband who gave them to a what whom did he give them to a mistress no on my life he did not himself confessed it with curses on her avarice i'll not believe it he has no mistress or if he has why is it told to me to guard you against insults he told me that to move you to compliance he forged that letter pretending i was ruined ruined by him too the fraud succeeded and what a trusting wife bestowed in pity was lavished on a wanton then i am lost indeed and my afflictions are too powerful for me his follies i have borne without upbraiding and saw the approach of poverty without a tear my affections my strong affections supported me through every trial be patient madam patient the barbarous man and does he think my tenderness of heart is his security for wounding it but he shall find that injuries such as these can arm my weakness for vengeance and redress stukely aside ha then i may succeed redress is in your power what redress forgive me madam if in my zeal to serve you i hazard your displeasure think of your wretched state already want surrounds you is it impatience to bear that to see your helpless little one robbed of his birthright a sister too with unavailing tears lamenting her lost fortune no comfort left you but ineffectual pity from the few outweighed by insults from the many am i so lost a creature well sir my redress to be resolved is to secure it the marriage vow once violated is in the sight of heaven dissolved start not but hear me tis now the summer of your youth time has not cropped the roses from your cheek though sorrow long has washed them then use your beauty wisely and freed by injuries fly from the cruelest of men for shelter with the kindest and who is he 
a friend to the unfortunate, a bold one too, who while the storm is bursting on your brow and lightning flashing from your eyes, dares tell you that he loves you. Would that these eyes had heaven's own lightning, and that with a look thus I might blast thee, am I then fallen so low? Has poverty so humbled me that I should listen to a hellish offer and sell my soul for bread? O oh, villain, villain! But now I know thee and thank thee for the knowledge. If you are wife, you shall have cause to thank me. An injured husband, too, shall thank thee. Yet no proud woman, I have a heart as stubborn as your own, as haughty and imperious, and as it loves, so can it hate. Mean, despicable villain, I scorn thee and thy threats. Was it for this that Beverley was false, that his too credulous wife should in despair and vengeance give up her honour to a wretch? But he shall know it, and vengeance shall be his. Why send him for defiance, then? Tell him I love his wife, but that a worthless husband forbids our union. I'll make a widow of you, and court you honourably. Oh, coward, coward, thy soul will shrink at him. Yet in the thought of what may happen, I feel a woman's fears. Keep thy own secret, and be gone. Who's there? Scene 8. Enter Lucy. Your absence, sir, would please me. I'll not offend you, madam. Exit with Lucy. Why opens not the earth to swallow such a monster? Be conscience, then, his punisher, till heaven in mercy gives him penitence or dooms him in its justice. Scene 9. Re-enter Lucy. Come to my chamber, Lucy. I have a tale to tell thee shall make thee weep for thy poor mistress. Yet heaven the guiltless sufferer regards, and whom it most afflicts, it most rewards. Exeunt. End of Act 3. Act 4 of The Gamester by Edward Moore. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 4. Scene Beverley's Lodgings. Enter Mrs. Beverley, Charlotte, and Lucen. The smooth tongued hypocrite. But we have found him, and will requite him. To Mrs. Beverley. Be cheerful, madam, and for the insults of this ruffian, you shall have ample retribution. But not by violence. Remember you have sworn it. I had been silent else. You need not doubt me. I shall be cool as patience. See him tomorrow, then. And why not now? By heaven! the veriest worm that crawls is made of braver spirit than this stukely yet for my promise i'll deal gently with him i mean to watch his looks from those and from his answers to my charge much may be learnt next i'll to bates and sift him to the bottom if i fail there the gang is numerous and for a bribe will each betray the other. Good night. I'll lose no time. Exit. These boisterous spirits, how they wound me. But reasoning is in vain. Come, Charlotte, we'll to our usual watch. The night grows late. I am fearful of events, yet pleased. Tomorrow may relieve us. Going. Scene two. Enter Jarvis. How now, good Jarvis? I have heard ill news, ma'am. What news? Speak quickly. Men are not what they seem. I fear me Mr. Stukeley is dishonest. We know it, Jarvis. 
but what's your news that there's an action against my master at his friend's suit oh villain villain twas this he threatened then run to that den of robbers wilson's your master may be there entreat him home good jarvis say i have business with him but tell him not of stukely it may provoke him to revenge haste haste good jarvis exit jarvis this minister of hell oh i could tear him piecemeal i am sick of such a world yet heaven is just and in its own good time will hurl destruction on such monsters Excellent. scene three changes to stukeley's lodgings enter stukeley and bates meeting where have you been filling my time away playing my tricks like a tame monkey to entertain a woman no matter where i have been vexed and disappointed tell me of beverley how bore he his last shock like one so dawson says whose senses had been numbed by misery when all was lost he fixed his eyes upon the ground and stood some time with folded arms stupid and motionless then snatching his sword that hung against the wainscot he sat him down and with a look of fixed attention drew figures on the floor at last he started up looked wild and trembled and like a woman seized with her sex's fits laughed out loud while the tears trickled down his face so left the room ah this was madness the madness of despair we must confine him then a prison would do well a knocking at the door hark that knocking may be his go that way down exit bates who's there scene four enter lucin an enemy an open and avowed one why am i thus broken upon this house is mine sir and should protect me from insult and ill manners guilt has no place of sanctuary wherever found tis virtue's lawful game the fox's hold and tiger's den are no security against the hunter your business sir to tell you that i know you why this confusion that look of guilt and terror is beverly awake or has his wife told tales the man that dares like you should have a soul to justify his deeds and courage to confront accusers not with a coward's fear to shrink beneath reproof stukely aloud and in confusion who waits there by heaven he dies that interrupts us shutting the door you should have weighed your strength sir and then instead of climbing to high fortune the world had marked you for what you are a little paltry villain you think i fear you i know you fear me this is to prove it pulls him by the sleeve you wanted privacy a lady's presence took up your attention now we are alone sir why what a wretch flings him from him the vilest insect in creation will turn when trampled on yet has this thing undone a man by cunning and mean arts undone him but we have found you sir traced you through all your labyrinths if you would save yourself fall to confession no mercy will be shown else first prove me what you think me till then your threatenings are in vain and for this insult vengeance may yet be mine infamous coward why take it now then draws and stukely retires alas i pity thee yet that a wretch like this should overcome a beverley it fills me with astonishment a wretch so mean of soul that even desperation cannot animate him to look upon an enemy you should not thus have soared sir 
unless, like others of your black profession, you had a sword to keep the fools in awe. Your villainy has ruined. Villainy. T'were best to curb this license for your tongue. For no, sir, for there are laws. This outrage on my reputation will not be borne with. Laws. Darst thou seek shelter from the laws? Those laws which thou and thy infernal crew live in the constant violation of. Talkest thou of reputation, too, when under friendship's sacred name thou hast betrayed, robbed, and destroyed? I rail at gaming. Tis a rich topic, and affords noble declamation. Thou preach against it in the city. You'll find a congregation in every tavern. If they should laugh at you, fly to my lord and sermonize it there. He'll thank you and reform. And will example sanctify a vice? No, wretch. The custom of my lord, or of the sit that apes him, cannot excuse a breach of law, or make the gamester's calling reputable. Rail on, I say. But is this zeal for beggared Beverly? Is it for him that I am treated thus? Nah, he and his might all have groaned in prison. Had but the sister's fortune escaped the wreck, to have rewarded the disinterested love of honest Mr. Lucen. How I detest thee for the thought! But thou art lost to every human feeling. Yet let me tell thee, and it may wring thy heart, that though my friend is ruined by thy snares, thou hast unknowingly been kind to me. Have I? It was indeed unknowingly. Thou hast assisted me in love, given me the merit that I wanted, since but for thee my Charlotte had not known t'was her dear self I sighed for, and not her fortune. Thank me, and take her then. And as a brother to poor Beverly, I will pursue the robber that has seized him, and snatch him from his gripe. And no, imprudent man, he is within my gripe. And should my friendship for him be slandered once again, the hand that has supplied him shall fall and crush him. Why, now there's spirit in thee. This is indeed to be a villain. But I shall reach thee yet. Fly where thou wilt, my vengeance shall pursue thee. And Beverly shall yet be saved. Be saved from thee, thou monster, nor owe his rescue to his wife's dishonour. Exit. Stukely, pausing. Then ruin has enclosed me. Curse on my coward heart. I would be bravely villainous, but tis my nature to shrink at danger, and he has found me. Yet fear brings caution, and that security. More mischief must be done to hide the past. Look to yourself, officious Lucen. There may be danger stirring. How now, Bates? Scene five. Enter Bates. What is the matter? Twas Lucen and not Beverly that left you. I heard him loud. You seem alarmed, too. Aye, and with reason. We are discovered. I feared as much and therefore cautioned you, but you were peremptory. Thus fools talk ever, spending their idle breath on what is past, and trembling at the future. We must be active. Beverly, at worst, is but suspicious, but Lucen's genius, and his hate to me, will lay all open. Means must be found to stop him. What means? Dispatch him. Nay, start not. Desperate occasions call for desperate deeds. We live but by his death. You cannot mean it. I do, by heaven. Good night, then. Going. Stay. I must be heard, then answered. Perhaps motion was too sudden, and human nature starts a murder, though strong necessity compels it. I have thought long of this, and my first feelings were like yours. A foolish conscience awed me which soon I conquered. The man that would undo me, nature cries out, 
undo brates know their foes by instinct and where superior force is given they use it for destruction shall man do less loosen pursues us to our ruin and shall we with the means to crush him fly from our hunter or turn and tear him tis folly even to hesitate he has obliged me and i dare not why live to shame then to beggary and punishment you would be privy to the deed yet want the soul to act it nay more had my designs been levelled at his fortune you had stepped in the foremost and what is life without its comforts those you would rob him of by lingering death add cruelty to murder henceforth adieu to half-made villains there's danger in them what you have got is yours keep it and hide with it i'll deal my future bounty to those who merit it what's the reward equal division of our gains i swear it and will be just think of the means then he's gone to beverley's wait for him in the street tis a dark night and fit for mischief a dagger would be useful he sleeps no more consider the reward when the deed's done i have farther business of you send dawson to me think it already done and so farewell exit why farewell loosen then and farewell to my fears this night secures me I await the event with him exit scene six changes to the street stage darkened enter beverley how like an outcast do i wander loaded with every curse that drives the soul to desperation the midnight robber as he walks his rounds sees by the glimmering lamp my frantic looks and dreads to meet me whither am i going my home lies there all that is dear on earth it holds too yet are the gates of death more welcome to me i'll enter it no more who passes there tis lucen he meets me in a gloomy hour and memory tells me he has been meddling with my fame scene seven enter lucen beverley well met i have been busy in your affairs so i have heard sir and now must thank you for it to-morrow i may deserve your thanks late as it is i go to bates discoveries are making that an arch villain trembles at discoveries are made sir that you shall tremble at where is this boasted spirit this high demeanour that was to call me to account you say i have wronged my sister now say as much but first be ready for defence as i am for resentment draws what mean you i understand you not the coward stale acquittance who when he spreads foul calumny abroad and dreads just vengeance on him cries out what mean you i understand you not coward and calumny whence are these words but i forgive and pity you your pity had been kinder to my fame but you have traduced it told a vile story to the public ear that i have wronged my sister tis false show me the man that dares accuse me i thought you brave and of a soul superior to low malice but i have found you and will have vengeance this is no place for argument nor shall it be for violence imprudent man who in revenge for fancied injuries would pierce the heart that loves him but honest friendship acts from itself unmoved by slander or ingratitude the life you thirst for shall be employed to serve you tis thus you would compound then first do a wrong beyond forgiveness and to redress it load me with kindness unsolicited i'll not receive it your zeal is trouble to me no matter it shall be useful it will not be accepted it must you know me not yes for the slanderer of my fame who under show of friendship arraigns me of injustice 
buzzing in every ear foul breach of trust and family dishonor have i done this who told you so the world tis talked of everywhere it pleased you to add threats too you were to call me to account why do it now then i shall be proud of such an arbiter put up your sword and know me better i never injured you the base suggestion comes from stukely i see him and his aims what aims i'll not conceal it twas stukely that accused you to rid him of an enemy perhaps of two he fears discovery and frames a tale of falsehood to ground revenge and murder on i must have proof of this wait till tomorrow then i will good night i go to serve you forget what's past as i do and cheer your family with smiles tomorrow may confirm them and make all happy exit beverly pausing how vile and how absurd is man his boasted honour is but another name for pride which easier bears the consciousness of guilt than the world's just reproofs but tis the fashion of the times and in defence of falsehood and false honour men die martyrs i knew not that my nature was so bad stands musing scene eight enter bates and jarvis this way the noise was and yonder's my poor master i heard him at high words with lucen the cause i know not i heard him too misfortunes vex him go to him and lead him home but he comes this way i'll not be seen by him exit beverley starting what fellow's that seeing jarvis art thou a murderer friend come lead the way i have a hand as mischievous as thine a heart as desperate too jarvis to bed old man the cold will chill thee why are you wandering at this late hour your sword drawn too for heaven's sake sheathe it sir the sight distracts me beverley wildly whose voice was that twas mine sir let me entreat you to give the sword to me ay take it quickly take it perhaps i am not so cursed but heaven may have sent thee at this moment to snatch me from perdition then i am blessed continue so and leave me my sorrows are contagious no one is blessed that's near me i came to seek you sir and now thou hast found me leave me my thoughts are wild and will not be disturbed such thoughts are best disturbed i tell thee that they will not who sent thee hither my weeping mistress am i so meek a husband then that a commanding wife prescribes my hours and sends to chide me for my absence tell her i'll not return those words would kill her kill her would they not be kind then but she shall live to curse me i have deserved it of her does she not hate me jarvis alas sir forget your griefs and let me lead you to her the streets are dangerous be wise and leave me then the night's black horrors are suited to my thoughts these stones shall be my resting place lies down here shall my soul brood o'er its miseries till with the fiends of hell and guilty of the earth i start and tremble at the morning's light for pity's sake sir upon my knees i beg you to quit this place and these sad thoughts let patience not despair possess you rise i beseech you there's not a moment of your absence that my poor mistress does not groan for have i undone her and is she still so kind starting up it is too much my brain can't hold it oh jarvis 
Jarvis! How desperate is that wretched state which only death or madness can relieve! Appease his mind, good heaven, and give him resignation. Alas, sir, could beings in the other world perceive the events of this, how would your parents' blessed spirits grieve for you, even in heaven? Let me conjure you by their honoured memories, by the sweet innocence of your yet helpless child, and by the ceaseless sorrows of my poor mistress, to rouse your manhood, and struggle with these griefs. Thou virtuous good old man! Thy tears and thy entreaties have reached my heart through all its miseries. Oh! had i listened to thy honest warnings no earthly blessing had been wanting to me i was so happy that even a wish for more that i possessed was arrogant presumption but i have warred against the power that blessed me and now am sentenced to the hell i merit be but resigned sir and happiness may yet be yours prithee be honest and do not flatter misery i do not sir hark i hear voices come this way we may reach home unnoticed well lead me then unnoticed didst thou say alas i dread no looks but of those wretches i have made at home Exeunt. scene nine changes to stukeley's enter stukeley and dawson come here there dawson my limbs are on the rack, my soul shivers in me till this night's business be complete. Tell me thy thoughts. Is Bates determined, or does he waver? At first he seemed irresolute, wished the employment had been mine, and muttered curses on his coward hand that trembled at the deed. And did he leave you so? No, we walked together and sheltered by the darkness saw beverly and loosen in warm debate but soon they cooled and then i left them to hasten hither but not till twas resolved loosen should die thy words have given me life that quarrel too was fortunate for if my hopes deceive me not it promises a grave to beverly you misconceive me listen and he were friends but my prolific brain shall make them enemies if lucian falls he falls by beverley an upright jury shall decree it ask me no questions but do as i direct this writ takes out a pocket book for some days past i have treasured here till a convenient time called for its use that time is come gives a paper take it and give it to an officer it must be served this instant on beverley look at it tis for the sums that i have lent him must he to prison then i asked obedience not replies this night a jail must be his lodging tis probable he's not gone home yet wait at his door and see it executed upon a beggar he has no means of payment dull and insensible if lucian dies who was it killed him why he that was seen quarrelling with him and i that knew of beverley's intents arrested him in friendship a little late perhaps but twas a virtuous act and men will thank me for it now sir you understand me most perfectly and will about it haste then and when tis done come back and tell me till then farewell exit now tell thy tale fond wife and loosen if again thou canst insult me <laughs> i'll kneel and own thee for my master not avarice now but vengeance fires my breast and one short hour must make me cursed or blessed. Exit. 
End of Act 4